Turn with me to Amos chapter 1. We're going to be looking at uh, judgment of the Gentile nations. So carry us through chapter 1, verse 1, into chapter 2, verse 3. And then next week we'll deal with, you know, a small little snippet of Judah and, uh, and then a bunch of the northern kingdom of Israel as we make our way through Amos. Yet if you guys are able to read through, I mean, really, for somebody like me who's a slow reader, it probably would take you about, you know, 45 minutes maybe to read nine chapters. I mean, maybe less. I don't know. But it's, it's good, and if you don't feel like reading it, uh, you can always connect with one of the Bible apps, and, and they have audio versions of it. You can just listen to it. It'll probably take you about half hour to listen to it and over and over again. Just get it in your mind and allow it to, to you to get really familiar with the book of Amos and, and what, what it is that God is, is doing as he's dealing with uh, Primarily dealing with the northern kingdom of Israel, right? So, so as we look at uh, our first chapter here, we'll go ahead and read through, and then we'll pray and see what the Lord has for us. So, the word of Amos, who was among the sheep breeders of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And he said, The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem, the pastures of the shepherd's mound, and at the top of Carmel withers. There, uh, thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Damascus and for four I will not turn away its punishment, because they have threshed Gilead with implements of iron. But I will send a fire into the house of Haziel, which shall devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. I will also break the gate bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitants of the valley of Haven and the one who scold, holds the scepter from uh, Beth Eden. The people of Syria shall go captive to Kerr, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four I will not turn away its punishment because they took captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom. But I will send a fire upon the wall of Gaza which shall devour its palaces. I will cut off the inhabitants from Ashdod, the one and the one who holds a scepter from Eshkelon. I will turn my hand against Ekron, and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, says the Lord God. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Ty, you get you starting to notice there's a pattern there, right? <laughs> for three transgressions. Uh, of Tyre and for four I will not turn away its punishment because they deliver up the whole captivity of Edom of which uh, and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood but I will send a fire upon the wall of Tyre which shall devour its palaces thus says the Lord for three transgressions of Edom and for four I will not turn away its punishment because he pursued his brother with the sword and cast off all pity his anger tore perpetually and he kept it, his wrath forever but I will send a fire upon Taman, which shall devour the palaces of Basra. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the people of Ammon, and for four I will not turn away its punishment, because they rip open the women with child and Gilead, and Gilead that they, may, they might enlarge their territories. But I will kindle a fire in the wall of Rehab, Rehab, Rabbah, excuse me, and it shall devour its palaces amid shouting in the midst in, in the day of the battle and the tempest of the day of the whirlwind their king shall go into captivity he and the and his prince together says the lord thus says the lord for three transgressions of moab and for four i will not turn away its punishment because he burned the bones of the king of edom to lime but i will send a fire upon moab and it shall devour the uh, the palaces of uh, Kiroth. Moab shall die with tumult, with shouting and trumpet sound, and I will cut off the judgment from its midst and slay all its princes with them, says the Lord. And so, Father, we thank you for, for God, the, the words of warning that you give. Um, these things took place, these things happened, the judgments came, and, and yet they stand as a warning to us as the things that we do can 
bring about consequences to our own lives. And so I pray, God, that you would have your hand upon us, speak to us, God, even now as we look to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. And so Amos, Amos, you guys know, prophesied in a time where the nation of Israel was divided. Um, they also were in great wealth and had a lot of power and all that, but they were totally corrupt. And they became like the Gentile nations as they gave into adultery, idolatry rather, and, and by worshiping the gods of the pagans. They went off the rails. You know, they, they stopped serving the true and the living God, and it became like those that they were supposed that, that, that they were supposed to be different from. And that happens even today. Look at the church today. How many churches are conforming to the standards of the world rather than being a light and a beacon and allowing the world to see them and want to conform to the image of Jesus Christ? There's too much, too much conformity with, with the world today for Christians. Why? Because we want to be liked. And I, I think there's a lot of that with, with the nation of Israel here, both northern and southern kingdom, where they probably didn't want the conflict, probably didn't want the hassle, probably didn't, probably wanted to be liked by everybody. So rather than, you know, getting into a bunch of conflicts, they just decided to go along to get along, right? And a lot of what we'll see later is how, you know, God talks about how, uh, how he doesn't, he, he, he can't stand the fact that they're still sacrificing to him and making offerings to him while they're worshiping the gods of the pagans, right? And, and it makes him sick. And he's going to destroy them, not entirely, but he, he is going to bring judgment upon them for that. Amos begins his ministry as a prophet by pronouncing judgment upon the Gentile nations, but then he moves to the southern kingdom of Judah and finally to the northern kingdom of Israel. This is proof that God shows no partiality to anyone, which Paul tells us in Romans chapter 2. Colossians chapter 3 verse 25 and Peter tells us in Acts chapter 10 verse 34. If you're a note taker, you can jot that down, look them up later. We've gone through some of that already. So if his people are going to act like pagans, then guess what he's going to do? He's going to treat them and judge them like pagans. Want to act like the world? Don't be surprised when you get judged like the world. We can't sit here and act like Christians when we're here in the building, when we're together, whatever, and then act whatever way we want when nobody's around and we think nobody's looking. It's inconsistent with who we're supposed to be. I'm not saying that we don't struggle and that we don't have issues and sometimes we become fearful uh, of, the, uh, of the people in the world and the contempt they might show us and what they might say. I'm not saying that, but those are things that we need to pray through and, and work out. You know, we're called to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, but if all we ever do is tremble and we don't work anything out, then what's the point, right? And we're ever sitting there scared and shaking, you know, instead of actually being different, instead of actually changing and in, in attempting to be more like Christ and less like ourselves. The author of the book here, obviously, is Amos. Uh, Amos tells us that he's a sheep breeder in a small village. Uh, called Tekoa. It's approximately 10 miles south of Jerusalem. Amos also grew up tending sycamore trees. And per, that they per, produced like a, a fig-like fruit. And so he produced these, he, he grew these trees. He was a farmer. He was a sheep herder and a farmer in, the, in, in his town of Tekoa. Amos was also the only prophet to list his occupation uh, before declaring his ministry as a prophet, which became clear again in Amos chapter 7 verse 14, where he states uh, states this. It says, Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet, but I was a sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit. And this is who Amos is. He, was, he wasn't a prophet. They're calling him out and they're telling, they're, they're telling Amos, hey, stop prophesying. No more prophesying against Israel. No more doing it. And so Amos said, look, I was no prophet. God called me to this and I answered the call. What are you going to say? No to God? I, I mean, you know, just as, it doesn't make sense. No, Lord, I'm not doing it, right? 
Amos stepped up. And, and he became what God needed him to become, which was a vessel, something that he could use for his honor and for his glory. Amos had one plan for his life. And God took that plan and he crushed it. And then he reshaped it into something that was usable for the kingdom. And so as he's telling you know, them all the things that they're doing wrong, they're, they're telling them, hey, stop doing that. Stop saying these things. And then God tells them, you're going to get judged. You're going to die. Your wife's going to become a harlot. All the kinds of things that he tells them as we get into the later chapters of, of Amos. The life of Amos as a prophet speaks to what Peter said about when, where prophecies come from in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, right? It's not Amos's words. You know, a lot of people will always say and claim, oh, the Bible was written by men, it's man's opinion, men's this, man's that. No, it's not. These were God's words breathed out through these men via the Holy Spirit. The, the scripture, the prophecy, the things that they're saying is not of their own doing. It's not their own words that they conjured up and that they made, you know, to, to sound great. These are the words of God, what God was speaking into his people as he's warning them. First, the Gentile nations he's warning, and he's going to judge them. And then he goes off to warn his people, and, and, and he's going to judge them as well. Because again, God shows no partiality. Amos, we know, was not a reluctant prophet like Jonah. You know, he was humble and willing because he knew that he was called and what he was called to do for the Lord. You know, I, Jonah gets a bad rap, and I get it because Jonah. You know, he didn't want to go, you know, preach to the Ninevites. He didn't want to go tell them that they need to repent. And the reason he didn't want to do that is because he knew that God would forgive them. And he hated the Ninevites. He hated them. And so you get it. I mean, the, the things that they did, they were ruthless. And he did not want them to be saved. But that is not his prerogative. It's not mine. It's not yours. There are people in this world that you might think to yourself, that person's disgusting. The things that they do are morally reprehensible, and God can never save them. Shame on you if you say that. Shame on me if I say that. God will save who he chooses to save, and it doesn't matter what that person's done. But God can't save them. You know, that's a big, you know, whether true or not, I kind of tend to believe it might be that Jeffrey Dahmer gave his life to Christ and changed his life, and then he was murdered in prison. Well, justice was served. Now he's in heaven. You got a problem with that? If he gave his life to Christ, do you have a problem with that? Because if you do, your problem is not with me or with anybody who might believe that. It's with God. Because if he is actually there, we won't know until we get there. And when we get there, we won't care anymore, right? It won't be like, I'm going to go find out why God did that, right? Why would you save him? You're not going to care. Mostly because you're probably going to be surprised that you're even there, right? I'm in heaven. Wow, what a miracle, right? It's going to be amazing. Again, the purpose of Amos here was that as he prophesied during the reigns of King Jeroboam II of Israel, which was from 793 to 753 BC, and King Uzziah of Judah from 792 to 740 BC, but he specifically prophesied, it says, two years before the earthquake. Okay, so there, there, there's a time stamp there. So whatever earthquake took place shortly after he was done prophesying, you know, when, what he had to say to the Gentile nations and to Judah and Israel, after that an earthquake happened a couple years after that, and then that's your, that's your stamp to know when in history this took place. And so Zechariah makes reference to this particular earthquake in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 5. It says, Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Azel. 
Yes, you shall flee as you flee from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. Now the, the, the thing is, it's not as if earthquakes were uncommon in that region, but this one was memorable. That's why he says, two years before the earthquake. Not two years before, you remember that little tremor that we had that one time, or you remember this, or remember that? You know, and this was the earthquake. This shook things up, and you remember it. Amos lived in the Judean town of Tekoa and has some words of judgment for them, which we get in chapter 2. But the main focus of his prophecy is directed towards the northern kingdom of, of Israel again. So he lived in that Judea region, but his main prophecy is for the northern kingdom of Israel. So it was because of her idolatry and rebellion that he spoke to them. Now, Judah isn't out of the woods. Judah doesn't get a slap on the wrist. They get thumped pretty hard too. But different prophets spoke to different, you know, one, some spoke to the northern kingdom, some spoke to the southern kingdom. Amos here is predominantly the northern kingdom of Israel. And there are 10 tribes in that. So Amos prophesied concerning the destruction of Israel, but he also speaks of the remnant that God would preserve as they repented. Again, Amos will actually plead for them. You know, don't, don't utterly wipe them out. God will listen to him in the latter chapters. And it's important because we know that as Paul speaks about in Romans, that there is a remnant that is left that will be saved, that will come back to, to God. But that won't happen until, you know, we're, we're later on into the, the tribulation period, great tribulation period. And so, God can and does hold back his judgment against those who have sinned against him. You and I are living proof of that, right? But again, if you have a true heart of repentance and your, your desire is to do what God wants you to do, then all you have to do is turn from your sin. Repent. Ask for forgiveness. And God is there. But if you don't, then you and I leave God with no choice but to judge us. And that's never a good thing. Look, we may think that we're getting away with something because, oh, look, I'm doing what I'm doing and I haven't felt any, any of the, you know, wrath of God upon me. Be patient, right? God has plenty of time. He's not like you and I. You and I live in a, a finite period of time. If you're really lucky, 70, 80 years, something like that, you get in that, that neighborhood. Not you, though, Jerry. You're going to live forever. But... You get in that neighborhood, and you know God is calling, right? But we live in this finite time period, but God lives outside of time and space. He sees the end from the beginning. And so we're told, and as I'll probably mention more than once tonight, that a thousand years to God is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years. He's got plenty of time to deal with you and with me. So don't assume that God is not going to judge you in your sin. So I'm just going to continue to live this way because you're heaping judgment, more and more judgment upon yourself. And that's what was happening with, with Judah and with Israel. They got so comfortable living among the, the pagans who, by the way, they were supposed to go in and utterly destroy when they took over the land, and they didn't, so they brought it upon themselves, right? They made treaties with people that they weren't supposed to make treaties with them. And so they brought this upon themselves, but they got so comfortable that they figured, 
we're God's chosen people, and you're going to see that next week a lot. They, they, they feel so confident that they are God's chosen people, and he is not going to judge us, that they're doing whatever they want. They're making sacrifices to him on the altar, pretending to worship him, all while they're living their lives whatever way they want. So Sunday holy, the rest of the week not so much. Verses 1 and 2, Amos is called to prophesy against Israel. So the words of Amos, who was among the sheep breeders of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Judah. So you see that he is the prophet against the nation of Israel, which is, you, you, I know you're thinking nation as a whole, but really it's northern kingdom, because at this time, again, the kingdom is divided. So there's a northern and a southern kingdom. And so... Concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of jo jo uh, Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And he said, the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn and the top of uh, Carmel withers. So Amos begins his book by declaring who he, who he is and who he's speaking to. Who his ultimate prophetic words that God is giving them are directed towards. Yes, he's going to really lay out and annihilate the Gentile nations, but ultimately this is for Israel and in part Judah to understand that look how he's dealing with the Gentile nations and watch how he deals with you in the exact same way. Only at the end, he's a little more merciful, right? He's going to leave a remnant. Because they're his people, and he does love them, and he wants to see them repent. The name Amos means born by God, load, trouble, or burden. Amos was given a burden for the people of Israel by God, which is why this sheep breeder and fig tree farmer, or whatever he is, right, was willing to take up the mantle of prophet. He was no prophet, but he was willing to do it. God gave him a burden. Amos prophesied during that divided kingdom, which we talked about, which is why he mentions two different kings, but he narrows down the time frame by mentioning uh, that it was two years before the earthquake. So it was very specific time during those two kingdoms and those two king ruling kings. It may have recurred around 762 BC. Not really, we don't really know for sure, but somewhere close in that range is probably uh, accurate. While earthquakes, again, were not uncommon in that region, this one had to have stuck out, which is why Amos would have mentioned it. So Amos tells the people that the Lord roars from Zion in judgment, just like a lion after it catches its prey. And that's one of the things that Amos will talk about numerous times through this book as he talks about how, you know, how lions, when they catch their prey, if there's no prey, well, they're not going to roar, right? If they haven't, if a young lion doesn't have anything to eat, it's not going to roar. If a snare is left out to catch prey, it's not going to automatically go off if nothing's in the snare, right? It's not going to go off by itself. And he, he talks about how it, you know, it would be for Israel as if a, a, a bear attack or a lion attacked it and they escaped the lion in part, but then a bear comes out and attacks them too. So it was just going to be just a, a, an utter annihilation and a ravaging of them. We're going to attack them. Again, he talks about that, how the Lord roars from Zion in judgment, just like a lion after it catches its prey, which caused the land to mourn. This caused the land to mourn because God has to go after his own people because of their sin. The, the, you guys remember... In Genesis 4, verse 9 through 11, right? How the ground cried out for justice when Cain killed his brother Abel. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I don't know, my brother's keeper? I don't know where he's at. I don't, I, 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 it's not my day to watch him, right? Imagine talking to the Lord like that. Anyway, he's just sitting there, he's not, I'm not his keeper. And he said, what have you done? God said to, to Cain, the voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood 
from your hand. The earth mourned. It was mourning because, one, that was the first murder. Not the first sin. Adam and Eve took care of that, but it was the first murder. And Abel's blood cried out from the ground. The ground was mourning what was taking place as, as sin came in. It entered into the garden that was perfect, and things went downhill from there. And so now we're in a place where you have the, the Lord roaring like a lion, getting ready to attack his people, getting ready to pronounce judgment on Israel. And so the, the, the earth is mourning that because they're going after false gods because they're living their lives like the lives of the pagans. The earth is currently crying out for justice even now from all the sin that's taken place and all the things that you and I have committed, that people are committing now. Again, we'll see God deal with this again as Jesus comes in his second coming. The earth is crying out. Listen, if Cain killed Abel, and Abel's blood was spilled on the ground and the ground is crying out for that, imagine how much the ground is crying out from the likes of Planned Parenthood, right? Imagine that. Now, he will get into that as he talks about the Amorites who decided because they wanted to increase their territory, they ripped open the pregnant women, right? This is, this is just, I mean, it's tragic. The, the amount of sin that we as a nation allow, the amount of moronic things that come out of Washington, D.C., it's disgusting. And these people need, they, they, they will pay a price. God will not be mocked and there will be retribution. And woe to them who do not repent in that day. Again, the Bible talks about, we, we read through it, right? How, how it would be better if a millstone be hung around these people's neck than they cause one of these little ones to stumble, whether that be in sin or whether that be in the fact that they're murdering them in the womb. You're causing people to sin and stumble. I was listening to, I think it was Charlie Kirk, and he was talking about the reason why Planned Parenthood won't show the women who are coming in a sonogram is because a majority, uh, like 80, 90% clip of these women would not have an abortion had they seen their baby in their womb, right? These people are dirty. Sin is just on them like a stench that can't be shaken. And the earth, the world knows it. And judgment's gonna come. You think all these earthquakes, the Bible talks about the end times, there'll be wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, floods, famines, all that. You see that today? I see it more than ever in my life. Part of that could just be the 24 hour news cycle that we've looped ourselves into. But I'm pretty sure that because of the vast amount of our sin as a nation, as, a world, as the world even, but as our nation, we're experiencing a lot of that with floods, famines, Pestilence, disease, COVID-19. Uh, seriously, the things that we have heaped upon ourselves as a nation because we refuse to allow babies to be born. That alone, not to mention all of the other sins that we commit, right? All the things that our school boards are trying to shove down the throats of parents and children. <clears throat> It's disgusting. And it should stop immediately. But again, we have the likes of Gavin Newsom and other politicians within our own state that could care less about any of that because they have an agenda. The sexualization of our children, right? For what end? To what end? For what purpose? so that they can mainstream pedophilia, like they've done with transgender and homosexuality, and calling yourself whatever, one of however many hundreds of imaginary different, you know, types of genders you think you are. 
God in the beginning created them male and female. And let me just say like they all do, full stop, right? No in between, no transitional forms. I don't care if you're transitioning from a doctor, no transitional forms. Male, female, end of story. And if we think we're gonna escape judgment as a nation, you know, we got another thing coming. The earth is crying out for justice. And the Lord is coming soon. We need to get our act together, especially as a church. When the church becomes as bad as the world, I mean, there's nothing but hell to pay. And it's coming. Verses 3 through 5, God's judgment on Damascus. And so here he begins and he starts the judgment of the Gentile nations after he kind of introduces the fact that I'm coming because God has called me to pronounce judgment upon Israel, right? But let's start with the Gentile nations. In verses 3 through 5, judgment on Damascus. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus, and for four I will not turn away its punishment, because they have threshed Gilead with implements of iron. But I will send fire into the house of Haziel, which shall devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. And I will also break the gate bar of Damascus, and cut off the inhabitants of the valley of Avon, and the one who holds the scepter from Beth Eden. The people of Syria shall go captive to Kerr, says the Lord. So Amos proclaims God's judgment on Damascus, the capital city of Syria, which is also believed to be the oldest city in the world, the oldest place in the world. Fine, whatever, just an interesting little tidbit for you to digest. Amos tells the people of Damascus that God will not turn away his wrath because they were guilty of a great number of sins. God does not look kindly or favorably upon sin. And where sin is, God will have to judge it and deal with it. And so that includes, he says, the threshing of Gilead with implements of iron, which speaks of their extreme cruelty to their enemies. When they, when they would tear into them with these implements of iron, as it, it wouldn't matter. You're in battle. You're wounded. They didn't care. You surrender. They don't care. They're going to kill you. They're going to take you out with their implements of iron. Gilly was in the northeast part of Israel and belonged to them. So Syria, the Syrians of Damascus, uh, would attack Israel without provocation or mercy in order to take the land. In 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 32 and 33, it says, In those days the Lord began to cut off parts of Israel, and Haziel conquered them in all the territory of Israel. From the Jordan eastward to the land of Gilead, Gad, Reuben, and Manasseh. From uh, Aor, which is by the river Arnon, including Gilead and Bashan. So God allowed more wicked nations to judge and deal with his people. And you say, well that's not fair, then why is God judging these nations if he's the one who told them to do it? Because they are more wicked. And he is going to use them to humble his people. But that doesn't mean they're going to get away with what they've done. Right? God will use worse nations to deal with his people. And then he will deal with those nations as well. He's not going to let sin go. But just because I put, put them on you doesn't mean that they're going to get away with that either. But you're going to get a taste of it. You're going to get a taste of my wrath. Yes, God has wrath. He gets angry. He deals with sin wherever he finds it. you got to accept that. What's that saying? Do the time, or do the crime, do the time? Yeah, kind of like that. Only if you don't want to do the time, then repent, right? Turn. Turn to God. He'll forgive you. You may have some fallout from your sin, but he will forgive you and you will escape his everlasting judgment. God was going to send fire, it says in verse 4, to utterly destroy 
and devour the, the palaces of ben Hadad. Again, these are things that are consistent throughout his judgment of both the nation, uh, the Gentile nations, and his own people. As he lays out then the, their palaces, their strongholds, their places that they, they built up and thought were so great, this is what he would do. He would also break in verse 5 the gate bar of Damascus, making it virtually impossible for them to defend, defend against attacks. Their walled cities, their gates, the places that made them feel safe, right? He's going to allow them to fling right open and the enemy will be able to come in. God would also cut off the inhabitants of the Valley of Avon, which means Valley of Wickedness. So there you go. You know, he's going to cut them off. And the one who holds the scepter, he says, from Beth Eden, which means house of pleasure. So not only were they a wicked people, but they were people who indulged in pleasure. And he was going to cut them off. God doesn't look forward to pouring out his judgment ever. He doesn't sit there and go, here we go. I'm going to get you now. You thought you escaped. No, nope. I'm coming around and I'm going to get you. He doesn't do that. We leave him no choice but to judge us. And like somebody had said before, if God does not judge the United States of America for all our sin and all our atrocities against people, against mankind, against babies, then he has to give Sodom and Gomorrah an apology for what he did to them. Right? He wiped them off the face of the earth. The only ones that were left were Lot and his wife and his two daughters. We'll get to them in a little bit, but we'll get to, they should have just wiped them out too, right? But, but he left them and then his wife turned back longing for whatever was in Sodom and Gomorrah and she turned into a pillar of salt. And so his daughters, as we'll see, you know, concocted this disgusting plan, but we'll get there. I don't want to give it away. Spoiler alert, right? God doesn't look forward again to pouring out his judgment. Uh, which we're told about in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 10 and 11. Therefore you, O son of man, say to the house of Israel, thus you say, uh, thus you say if, your, if our transgressions and our sins lie upon us and we pine away in them, how can we then live? Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked but that the wicked turn from this way and live. And he says, turn, turn from your evil ways. Why should you die, O house of Israel? Right? Turn. God's sitting there pleading with them. Turn already. Look, what, look at the judgment that's come. Look at the things that have happened to you. Look at the wrath that you've caused me to pour out upon you. Turn from your sin already. Stop. Stop sinning against me. And listen, as much as God is speaking to them through Ezekiel, in this time he's speaking to us as the church and as non-believers. Stop. Turn away from the sin that you're, that you're into. Turn. I don't want to judge, but I will. You're forcing me to stop. Again, when people refuse to turn from their sin, God's left with no choice. So before we go blaming him for the calamity that's come upon us, we need to look in the mirror. We need to see who the real cause of the judgment is. And that's you, that's me. Look, the church itself is not going to, it may escape God's wrath, right? We're not, we're not going to see his wrath in the end times, we're going to be raptured out and all that. But I guarantee you, we're going to see some judgment and we're going to see some persecution. Because as a church, as the church in the United States of America, we've gone soft. The church allows any manner of sin to come in. Homosexuals teaching from the pulpit, and I'm not talking repentant and change life homosexuals, I am talking active homosexuals. 
active adulterers. Look, we're all sinners. I get that. Nobody's perfect. Nobody behind the pulpit is certainly perfect. We all need to repent. And we all need to keep that account short with the Lord. But when the church is just embracing and condoning the sin and not feeling one iota of guilt about it, that is a problem. When the homosexual community decides they're going to make their own Bible and take out all the things that have to do with homosexuality in it, I mean, what is that? You're inviting judgment. Go start your own religion, right? I mean, Joseph Smith did it. You know, uh, whoever invented, you know, Jehovah's Witness, they did it, right? Go start your own religion. Believe what you want. Why do you have to corrupt this one? You ever notice that? They have taken what God has made and they've corrupted it. They've taken the rainbow that God gave us as a sign that he will no longer judge, right, by flood. And they've turned it into something else. And it's despicable. They've turned it into their symbol of gay pride. So while God, somebody had said yesterday, we were joking around, somebody had said that while, while God may not flood, you know, the, the rainbow being a symbol of God not flooding the earth, you know, any longer, that there's a flood of homosexuals that are coming onto the earth, and that's just, that's just making the earth a horrible place. It's inviting judgment. Now, I totally butchered what, that, what the actual joke is actually funnier, but, you know, whatever. If I offended your sensibilities, I don't care. So, there you go. But, again, we cannot sit there and blame God for the calamity that befalls us. Because it has to do with us. It's what we have done that's caused God's wrath to come upon us. Amos declares that the people of Syria will go captive to Ker, which again takes place in 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 7 through 9. So Ahaz, excuse me, sent messengers to Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, saying, I am your servant and your son. Come up and save me from the hand of the king of Syria and from the hand of the king of Israel who rise up against me. And Ahaz took the silver and the gold that was found in the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and sent it as a present to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria heeded him. For the king of Assyria went up against Damascus and took it, carried its people captive to Ker, and killed a Re Rezin or Rezin, whatever his name might be. Again, God is not in a rush to judge because Amos wrote this around 760 BC in that range somewhere around there. And the captivity of Syria didn't take place until 732 BC, so there was some time in between there giving them ample time to repent. He gave his people time to repent. It's verses six through eight, God's judgment on Gaza. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza, for four I will not turn away its punishment because they took captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom, but I will send a fire upon the wall of Gaza, which shall devour its palaces, and I will cut off the inhabitants from Ashdod and the one who holds the scepter from Eshkelon. I will turn my hand against Ekron. I studied and listened to these names over and over again so I could actually pronounce them. It's, it's actually working out. And the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, says the Lord. And now I'll have that epic fail, right, when I can't pronounce it. Anyway, Amos proclaims God's judgment on Gaza, which was one of the five capitals or chief cities of the Philistines at that time. Again, these, these were the sworn enemies of Israel. You remember the Philistines, right? David, Goliath, Rock Slinger, right? I mean, these, they hated, hated Israel. 
Nephilim, right? The other cities that belong to the Philistines are listed here with the exception of one. Uh, Edom is there, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Ekron. The only one that's missing is, missing is Gath. The fact that Amos mentions these cities, these other cities, indicates that God's judgment is directed specifically at the entirety of the Philistine nation, right? He, he was not going to look kindly or deal kindly with them. God wasn't going to turn away his punishment from the Philistines because they had conquered the Israelites on the battlefield. And then they go back to their cities. They go back to the, the, the cities of Israel after they had conquered them and take the rest of the people captive. Not, not in order to just enslave them, but then they'd sell them off to Edom. They take them captive and make, make them slaves and make them enrich themselves with God's people. You think God's good with that? Amos was most likely referring to, uh, to what took place during the reign of Jeroboam in, in 2 Chron Chronicles chapter 21, verse 16 and 17. It says, Moreover, the Lord stirred up against Jeroboam the spirit of the Philistines and the Arabians who were near the Ethiopians. And they came up into uh, Judah and invaded it and carried away all the possessions that were found in the king's house and also the sons of, of his wives so that they were not, there was not a son left to him except Joha uh, here we go, right? Uh, Jehoiahaz, the youngest of his sons. He was the only one left, the only one they left behind. The Philistines would be destroyed by, by the Lord for what they had done to his people in Gaza. They were going to be taken out. Again, that was spoken about in Joel chapter 3, verse 3 through 8. Remember, they would sell, like even in Hosea talks about some of that, how they would sell, buy and sell. You know, God, God's people would buy and sell their own people into slavery. Well, this was not looked upon good by God. And so what do you think he's going to think about the Gentiles doing that to his people? Even worse. Well, it's actually worse when your own people do it. But he's not going to look favorably upon either one of them. God wouldn't spare a remnant of the Philistines. They would all perish at the hand of the transgressors against Judah and Israel. He's not going to spare any of them. They're all going to die. He's going to deal with them. In verses 9 and 10, God's judgment on Tyre. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyre, for four I will not turn away its punishment. Because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. But I will send a, send a, a fire upon the wall of Tyre, which shall devour its palaces. So Amos moved on to the judgment here of Tyre, who had committed similar transgressions uh, against Judah and Israel as the Philistines had done. So it's only fitting that they received the same type of punishment that the Philistines received which is fire upon the wall of the city and the, the utter devastation of its palaces. This is, this is what God did, had done. He had taken what they had done and he had decided to destroy them with fire. I'm gonna burn down the walls, the things that you think make you strong, and your palaces, the things that you think make you rich and noteworthy, and I'm gonna bring them to ashes. The primary dif difference between what Tyre and the Philistines has done is that Tyre only delivered the people to Edom, while the Philistines carried the people away and delivered up the whole captivity to Edom. So Tyre just did it on a smaller scale, right? They just took what was given to them and then they went and sold them after. But that doesn't make it any better. Guilt by association. Tyre mo most likely bought the prisoners of Israel uh, from Israel's enemies in order to turn a profit by selling them to Edom. Slave trade was big, nothing new under the sun. You know, the same things that, you know, happened in this nation happened to Israel long before. They could even ship them out because Tyre from the Yeah, it's a port city, right. Exactly. Good point. The act of selling Jewish people into slavery to Edom caused Tyre to break their covenant with a brotherhood that King Hiram made with David and Solomon. 
in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 11, and 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 12. And so they had made a, a, a vow with him. Remember, he was the one who had supplied them with the wood and the supplies to make the temple. Remember, or, or yeah, the temple and also David's house and Solomon had made all these things, right? So, so he had supplied them. They had this like covenant brotherhood between them. And yet they sold them out. Verses 11 and 12, God's judgment on Edom. Thus says the Lord for three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not turn away its punishment because he pursued his brother with the sword and cast off all pity. His anger tore perpetually and he kept his wrath forever. But I will send a fire upon uh, Taman, which will devour the palaces of Basra. So Amos declares God's judgment on the people of Edom. Who are the descendants of Esau, right? Yep. The descendants of Esau, Jacob and Esau, right? Esau was the firstborn to Isaac, and he came out of the womb, and when he came out, a little heel catcher was holding on to him, right? From the very beginning, Jacob wanted everything that Esau had, including his heel, right? He just was grabbing hold. I'm coming out. And so God renamed Jacob, Israel, in Genesis chapter 32, verse 28. Esau never forgave Jacob for, well, for his own stupidity, right? He sold him his birthright for a bowl of lentil soup. Gross. I mean, if you like lentils, good for you. I don't. I mean, I'll eat them once in a while because I have to, but, you know, i got to get something good in the body. And, uh, McDonald's doesn't late make a lentil burger, so we're good. Anyway, so he, he gave, yeah, he sold him his birthright for a bowl of lentils. And then he turned around and tricked his father into giving him the, the birthright, the blessing that belonged to the firstborn by birthright, right? And so he ends up getting double blessing, gets his firstborn status, and then he gets his blessing as the firstborn. Tricked him. And that made Esau angry. So much so that Jacob had to go away and live with Laban for years. They go back together to bury Isaac, but the relationship oh, never so, resolved. Yeah, you, you saw that never as resolved. they got back together and then, and then, you know, Esau was kind of like, hey, yeah, we'll hang out. And then Jacob was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they went to the other side. And where, where Jacob wrestled with the Lord and then never returned. He never went back. There was always this division between them. To this day. To this day. And so, again, Amos, he declares that judgment upon them. Again, if you want to know more about the transgressions uh, of Edom uh, and God's judgment that he poured out upon them, you can read the book of Obadiah, all one chapter of it. So, you know, next book over to the right, Obadiah talks all about it in great detail. And so God's judgment on Edom was due uh, to their never-ending pursuit of Israel with the sword. Their lack of pity and their everlasting anger that was stirred up by Esau. Esau had nobody to blame but himself. Now, Jacob, again, he was a deceiver. That's part of his name, heel catcher, deceiver, until God changed his name to Israel. And then even after that, as you read about the life of Jacob, he goes back and forth. God goes back and forth calling him Jacob and calling him Israel. When, ja when Jacob was in the flesh, he was Jacob. When Jacob was walking with the Lord, he was Israel. And so you go back and forth. My grandmother, when I was born, you know, obviously my name, well, Maybe it's not obvious. My name is legally Daniel, right? Not Danny or Dan. When I'm mad at myself, I call myself Dan. Everybody calls me Danny. That's what I prefer. But when my grandmother was angry with me, she called me Daniel. And when she was really angry, it was Daniel Scott, right? That's my middle name. And she would, uh, again, you talk about going to pick your own switch off a tree and get spanked with it. That, that was my grandmother. Love her to death. She was a great woman. She wasn't referring to the biblical man. <laughs> no, no. 
She was a wonderful <laughs> woman. I loved her. She was my favorite. She was like my mother growing up. But she, she didn't suffer fools. And when I was a fool, I suffered. Even for three offenses? <laughs> three offenses? And for four. four. <laughs> That's right. It's That's enough right. is enough. Amen. So Edom wouldn't allow Israel to pass through their land. In Numbers chapter 20, verse 14 uh, through 21, the people of Edom allowed Esau's bitterness towards Jacob to, to cloud their judgment, to separate them from their brother, from their family. You know, they, they, were, they should have been tight, and yet they weren't. All those years went by. They allowed it to utter their hatred, Esau's hatred, to utterly consume them. Again, that's why God would cause the palaces of Basra to be devoured. You're going to have nothing. Nothing's going to be standing because of your hatred. In verses 13 through 15, God's judgment on Ammon. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the people of Ammon, and for four I will not turn away its punishment. Because they ripped open the, woman, the women with their children in Gilead, that they might enlarge their territory. But I will kindle the fire in the wall of Rabbah, and it shall devour its palaces amid shouting in the day of battle, and a tempest in the day of whirlwind. Their king shall go into captivity, he and his princes together, says the Lord. Amos goes on to speak of God's judgment against Ammon. Because they had ripped open the women of Gilead in order to expand their territory. And, and I don't even play around when I say this. That is Planned Parenthood. They are ripping it open in, the, in, in order to expand their territory and the almighty dollar. That is what they want. Don't be deceived. Planned Parenthood was started by a racist woman who wanted to wipe out the, the children of black women. This is not a joke. So supporting Planned Parenthood is to support racism. And I don't care, they can say whatever they want, it doesn't make a bit of difference to me. Truth hurts, and it stings a bit. But they're doing it in order to expand their territory. And it's a sad thing, and they will be judged for it harshly. The woman who started Planned Parenthood, she's dead now, and she's probably burning in the fires of hell, and rightfully so. Had she repented, we'd see her in heaven, right? Wouldn't care. Don't know if she did, kind of doubt it. But that's what the kind of judgment that comes from doing what, you know, she's done. Ammon's God was Molech. Molech, yeah, that was one of them. He holds his hands out. Yeah, the big burning fire. Yep. So. The act of cutting open pregnant women is where they cross the line in the eyes of the Lord. You want to expand your territory through war? Fine. But don't expand your territory by cutting open the pregnant women in order to terrify your enemy so that they'll flee. That's not acceptable. This is, this is kind of what happens today, right? So Israel does whatever it can in order to let people know we are going to bomb you because Hamas is, is bombing us. So get out, you have an hour. Hamas, on the other hand, barricades itself behind women and children. Right? Israel targets military installations. Things that Hamas uses in order to send their rockets. Right? Hamas targets civilians because they're cowards. And Israel has every right to defend themselves against such attacks, as any nation does. And so, in order to expand their territory, they try and strike fear into people by targeting the, the weakest among us. The children are weak, right? I mean, pretty much. But a pregnant, pregnant mother, I mean, struggling, 
they would just, I mean, rip her open in order to scare the rest of the people into leaving before they would hunt them down and kill them as well. Unborn children are innocent. I don't care how you come, how, how a woman becomes to be pregnant, I get it, you know, people will sit there, and even the church, by and large, has said, well, incest and rape, you know. And the child is innocent. If it's too painful, and, and I know, it'll be the, you're not a woman, you don't get it. I understand, okay, whatever, I don't really care either. But the problem is, this is what happens is that the church begins to justify things. Say, well, abortion, abortion's wrong except for this and this, you know? And it's not true. If you can't stand to look at the kid because it was part of incest or part of um, a rape or if it was, you know, consensual sex outside of marriage or consensual sex inside of marriage, whatever it might have been, give the kid up for adoption. And don't go hunting it down later. Let it live. It did nothing to you. And that's part of the problem. Part of the problem is as a nation, as a church, we've made provisions that God never made. That's the same thing with marriage, right? Jesus said because of the hardening of your heart, Moses gave you, allowed for you, God allowed for you to have a certificate of a divorce, but it was because of you. It wasn't because God ever intended it that way, because Jesus said from the beginning it was not so. God doesn't want you to get divorced. But if it's too much, he understands. And if there's adultery, he understands that. But then don't go expanding it to my husband neglects me, my husband, you know, talks down to me, my husband, so all that stuff now means, you know, well, we can divorce. No, it doesn't. Specific. Certificate of divorce for adultery because of the hardness of your heart. But it was never to be from the beginning. The Ammonites were the descendants of Lot and his younger daughter. So you get that from Genesis chapter 19, verse 38. And the younger, she also bore the son, uh, bore a son and called his name uh, ben, ben Ami. He is the father of the people of Ammon to this day. And so God had commanded the Israelites not to marry the women of Ammon uh, due uh, to their worship of the pagan god, as Jerry had pointed out, Molech, but also Milcom. So there was a couple of them that they worshipped, and I'm sure they worshipped more than that, which would, would ultimately lead to God's people straying from him. Solomon disobeyed the Lord. Uh, in this, which we know from 1 Kings chapter 11, verse uh, 1 and 2. But King Solomon loved many foreign women, polygamists, and many, 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 many wives, right? Yeah, right, so you get all these wives. As well as the daughters of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonites, and Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts from their, to their gods or after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. Solomon loved them even though God told him, look, you love these women, you marry these women, what's going to happen is they are going to cause you to stray from me and you are going to follow after their gods. And boy, didn't that happen. The destruction of Ammon started with Assyria in 734 BC during the reign of Tiglath, Pileser III, and continued with, ba uh, with Babylon in 586 BC during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. But the last mention of the Ammonites you can actually find in the second century BC when they were defeated by uh, uh, Judas Maccabees. And you can get that from those extra biblical books, one being 1 Maccabees chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. And so we move on now to the, to the end here of the Gentile nations in verses 1 and 3 through 3 in chapter 2 as God's judgment is poured out upon Moab. So thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Moab and for four I will not turn away its punishment because he burned the bones of the king of Edom to lime. 
but I will send a fire upon Moab, and it shall devour the palaces of uh, uh, Kiriath. Moab shall die with tumult, with shouting and trumpet sound, and I will cut off the judgment from its midst and slay all its princes with him, says the Lord. So Amos concludes the judgment of the Gentile nations with Moab here, who burned the bones of the king of Edom to lime. So apparently it wasn't enough for the king to just be dead. They had to either burn him to the point where his bones turned to dust, or they dug him up and they burned his bones to dust. Either way, whatever it might be, they wanted to make sure that he was desecrated. Right? No, no left, no memory. Take him in. Now again, this doesn't have anything to do with cremation. So people who are against cremation, get over it. This doesn't, this has nothing to do with that. This has everything to do with the fact that he did this in order to desecrate the body of the king of Edom. So, hi. <laughs> was that? Oh, was that you? Was that? <laughs> So they took, they took it a step further and burned uh, his bones, which was considered a form of dishonor, right? As well as signifying the desire to destroy any type of peace that the king of Edom might have received in death. They were just looking to utterly just destroy him. This lack of respect for the body of someone created in God's image is what caused the Lord to slay Moab and all its palaces. He was going to deal with them, or princes rather. They had no respect for, for God and his, his created beings. The Moabites, here we go again, were also the descendants of Lot from his oldest daughter. So the Amorites from the youngest daughter, Moabites from the oldest daughter. She was actually the genius that came up with this plan. Right? So they're leaving, picture this, they're leaving Sodom and Gomorrah, right? I mean, fire is raining down from heaven. Their mom turns around, turns to a pile of ashes. They don't even know it. They're walking, unless she was in front of them walking, and then they saw it, and whoa, right? And so they're figuring in their minds that the world has just ended. We are it. The three of us are it. You, me, and dad, that's it. We're it. We gotta do. We gotta repopulate the earth. We're all that's left. In Genesis chapter 19, verse 30 through 37, we read 38, so we won't read it again, but it says, Then Lot went out to the out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountains, and his two daughters were with him. For he was afraid to dwell in Zoar, and he and his two daughters dwelt in a cave. Now the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old. That's always great to hear. Yeah, our father's old. And there's no man on the earth to come into us as we are custom of all the earth. So there's no men left on the earth. It's just our dad and us, right? Come, let us make our father drink wine and we will lie with him. And we will preserve the lineage of our father. So they made their, their father drink wine at night. The firstborn went and laid with her father and he didn't know that, he, that she had laid down with him and she arose. It happened on the next day that the firstborn said to the younger, Indeed, I lay with my father last night. Let us make him drink wine tonight also, and you go in and lie with him, that we may preserve the lineage of our father. Then they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and laid with him, and he did not know that she laid down with uh, or, or, went, or when she arose. Thus both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father, the firstborn bore a son, called his name Moab, and the second is the father of the, uh, or rather, he is the father of Moabites to this day. And so and then again, ben Ami, ben Ami, whatever. And he was the Ammonite, right? They were the Ammonites. And so that's how that took place. And so God judged them. Moab was conquered by Nebuchadnezzar sometime after 598 BC, which opened up the door for Arab. Uh, tribes to inhabit its land. And now we have conflict to this day, right? Israel has conflict. No more Moab. No more Moab. These were God's judgment on the Gentile nations. 
But from look, that was like a chapter and not even a whole chapter. The beginning of the chapter was just laying out the fact that that Amos was there to talk about Israel's judgment, the northern kingdom. Then you have the rest of the chapter talking about the Gentile nations. Then the first three verses of chapter two, the rest of this is all about Israel because there's like three verses about, or two or three verses about Judah and then the rest is about the northern kingdom of Israel and the judgment that's going to be befall them because of their sin. The rest, again, of the book of Amos is reserved for the nation of Israel because of their disobedience and idolatry. Again, all the things that God has done, he judged his own people, the people that he loved, the people that were called by his name, he judged them. Do you think he's not going to judge us here, the United States, even the church in the United States? Reserved for us too. It is reserved. We are not reserved for wrath, for his wrath, but judgment, certainly. Persecutions, definitely. Do you think it's bad now? Give it a couple years. All the things that are going on, right? look, today or Tuesday, we had this big pronouncement that no, no more no more masks, we're good, no more social distancing, all this other nonsense, right? None of that anymore because our, our Lord and Master Gavin Newsom declared it to be so. Now understand, he's got a recall election coming up this year. Notice also, that when he should have, he did not revoke or rescind his emergency powers. Why do you suppose that is? Right around the time of election, right? All of a sudden, we're going to have to be locked down again. Now, I may be right, I may be wrong, but I'm no prophet, right? And I'm not claiming to be because a prophet had to be accurate 100% of the time, otherwise he was put to death, and I'm not doing that. I'm just saying what I see and what I think. You gotta understand that this nation, our nation, the things that are going on, we will be judged for all the things that are going on right now. All the things that, that, that are happening in this world, the fact that you know the church and, and people in general are not worshiping God as they ought to be, it's coming. And this is just, this past year and some change, it's just a taste of what's gonna happen. Make no mistake, it's gonna get worse. So you need to make a stand now. We need revival. So the church needs revival. The world needs salvation, right? The church gets revived, not the world. The world is blissfully ignorant of their death. They need salvation. They need to know that they can be born again. You and I, we're kind of asleep at the wheel. We need to be revived, and coffee ain't going to do it, right? Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we thank you for your word. We thank you for Amos and his not holding back of your judgments and the things that you say or you're going to do. And so, God, I pray as a people, as a nation, Lord, that we would humble ourselves before you. Seek your face, pray, Lord, that you might just hold off your wrath so that more people might come to know you. May we as a church, Lord, church in the United States not be comfortable, not sit back and rest in the fact that, well, we're saved, but reach out to people and, and tell them about your love. God, we look to, to be that beacon on a hill. So I ask even now, Lord, that you would help us, Lord. Help us to trust you. Help us to not do those things which disappoint or displease you, Lord that we might stave off your wrath by walking with you as we ought to, producing fruits worthy of repentance. So we love you, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you guys.